Hello. Uh, I'm, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Angela Chiapetta. I am Vice President of External Relations at CRESS. Uh, next up, we are going to have an armchair discussion for about 15 minutes to learn about the latest developments in biofuel and ethanol, um, a sweetheart of my past career, and um, how they're powering sustainable energy. So please welcome to the stage our Growth Energy CEO, Emily Score, and moderator, Anthony Reed, partner at FGS Global. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, my sincere pleasure, and that's not just panel fluff. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with Emily Score, the CEO of Growth Energy. I've had the pleasure of working with Emily in a couple of capacities over my career, and it's great to do our first armchair together. So I'm excited. With an audience. <laughs> yes, in front of everybody. Um, under en Emily's leadership, Growth Energy has become the premier voice for America's ethanol industry championing innovation, sustainability, and rural economic growth. Emily's relentless advocacy has helped shape national conversations on energy, climate, and agricultural policy, ensuring that biofuels remain at the forefront of America's energy, clean energy future. Growth Energy's work, spanning nearly two decades, that makes me feel old, has delivered real results, lowering carbon emissions, saving consumers money at the pump, and creating jobs across rural America. Emily, thank you for joining us and for your tireless commitment to the industry. Thank you, Anthony. So maybe to start, if you could give us a little bit more about you and the association and Growth Energy's mission and role in the broader biofuels industry. Sure, just by way of introduction. So we, rep we are the largest biofuel trade association in the country, and specifically we represent the U.S. ethanol industry. I've got about 100 biorefineries, 130 companies, innovators in the value chain across 33 states, not surprisingly with a real heavy emphasis and footprint in the Midwest. We are a trade association. We educate, we advocate on policies that really do advance the bioeconomy because ethanol is such a huge market for U.S. grain. We are really the engine of the rural economy. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of the bipartisan support and why that is. It goes back to the fact that we help keep small communities going and thriving. Um, and that's really kind of the mainstay of our relevance to, to the policy conversation in DC. So I think most people hear, hear the word ethanol, they know it, it's been around for a, for a long time. How do you explain the enduring popularity and the legislative success of biofuels in the US? And what makes the industry so strong with policymakers and the public? So I think there, there are two parts to that answer. The first is, is geography. Our base is geographically based. If you're a policymaker, a lawmaker in the Midwest, in a state where we are growing corn, where we're growing sorghum, where we're producing biofuel, you're going to be supporting us because of what we do for the economic base. So that goes across parties. Um, so that's, that's the base. Then you look at the value proposition of the industry, and it actually, we, we play across a spectrum that speaks to both Democratic priorities and it speaks to Republican priorities. And you look at some of our policy success in the Biden administration and the Trump administration, and, and I think it speaks volumes. So if you want low, low carbon energy, you want to decarbonize transportation liquid fuel, ethanol is going to be the avenue to do that. If you want to be decarbonizing in the hard to abate sectors like aviation, we're going to be a really exciting feedstock. Uh, if you want affordable fuel, accessible fuel, uh, a, a value chain that starts and stops on U.S. soil, so you're talking about energy independence or energy dominance, we check all of those boxes, and then, of course, I go back to, to that, that rural economy piece. And I think the greatest illustration of that bipartisan support is the success that we had most recently with the, with the big, beautiful bill. So there's a tax credit, 45Z. It's a clean fuel production tax credit. Importantly, it's technology neutral, and that's really important for us. The lower that we can get the carbon intensity of our fuel, the greater the tax incentive. Now, this is a concept that goes back 10 years. We started talking about this on Capitol Hill in 2015. It was first established in the Inflation Reduction Act. We know who supported that, right? That was strictly a partisan play on the Democratic side. In the One Big Beautiful Bill Act that cut $545 billion in IRA tax credits, not only did our tax credits survive 
it was extended and enhanced because we were able to make the case to those lawmakers in the administration on the value of what we're going to be able to do in terms of innovation in the rural economy. So that's exciting. Yeah, so, so getting to the one big beautiful bill and kind of where we are today, um, we've seen biofuels emerge as kind of this rare point of alignment between the Trump administration and renewable fuel industry. Where do you think this comes from and how does it shape your policy approach with the new paradigm that we're in this year? I mean, I think part of it goes back to the first Trump term. Um, he, has, he is very fond of the U.S. farmer. And so he is loyal to the U.S. farmer. The U.S. farmer helped elect him the first time and the second time. So there's, there's a very strong connection there. And in his first term, he changed, his EPA changed the regulation to increase access to higher blends of ethanol, which is a very big priority for us. All the cars on the road are driving in a 10% blend, 90% petroleum, 10% ethanol. We would like that to be 15% and your choice. We want you to have the choice to drive on that fuel. If you do that, we're lowering carbon emissions, you're saving money at the pump, and it's America first. So part of it goes back to the farmer, but um, if you look at the threads of what, what the administration is focused on, energy dominance, America first, and the policy outcomes, and day one, we had an executive order from the administration talking about E15, higher blends of ethanol enshrining biofuels in his domestic energy agenda. So there's a very strong connection to some of the real big priorities that are really important to this administration. And we're seeing that with some of the policy decisions already coming out of the EPA. Well, and, and you kind of transpose that looking at what recently happened in California, maybe is a good way to talk about California seeing ethanol as a solution to their problems out there. If you want to Maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, and which is exciting. Now, you know, California has a low carbon fuel standard, um, and by law, they've capped ethanol blends at 10%. 49 states in the country uh, have, a, a, it's legal to sell higher blends of ethanol. It hasn't been in California. Now, you would think in California, of all states, because of this priority of low carbon fuels, that that, that would be the reason for the state to want to, to embrace higher blends. In the end, it was actually about affordability and gas prices. And Governor Newsom passed a budget that included funds to be able to work on the regulations to get there. And the legislature just unanimously passed a law that would actually expedite approval of E15, this higher blend. And, and the impetus, again, is fuel prices and what the consumers are experiencing at the pump. So we're very, we're very happy, and hopefully the governor will sign that shortly. Then you'll have it available in 50 states. But again, that speaks to the incentive there. That was about affordability and fuel prices and the value proposition. Different decisions are, are really kind of based on other elements of the value proposition. Yeah, and totally different parties and et cetera. Yeah. So getting into some of the policy, maybe you could, all that you've kind of touched on, lay out what's growth policy priorities for this year? What, what are you working on? What's the most important things for your members? So it all comes down to access to market for us domestically and globally. And we should, and I want to talk about, about global as well. Uh, and so for us, our, our pri you know, top priority is, uh, well, the tax credit was important because that is important for us in our long-term ability to do something like sustainable aviation fuel. So setting that aside, year-round access to E15, the president supported that in his first term. Um, we, that was, that, there was a lawsuit, we lost in the courts, so now we need an act of Congress. We've got really good momentum. We've got broad support within liquid fuels for this legislation, so that's a priority. A strong renewable fuel standard, and the administration continues to signal, when we come out with, re with requirements, how much renewable fuel we will blend in 2026 and 2027, this administration proposed the highest blending requirements ever. And that's outstanding. And so again, they're signaling, we're doing this, because this is important for U.S. agriculture and it's important for, for biofuel demand. Um, and then access to market on the trade front. We are very excited that this administration is taking on trade barriers, tariff and non-tariff barriers. And the early returns, there's a lot of turbulence and churn, I recognize. But the early returns for us in some of these early bilateral agreements have strong upside for ethanol. And so we want to continue, we'll, we'll continue to work with the administration for, for market access because the globe is demanding low carbon fuel and they're increasingly demanding low carbon ethanol. That's great. D you know, talking about, and maybe you, you wanna to touch on the, the tax side too. I know that there are things that are important to you guys, but it kind of touches on the innovation story. So 
there's a lot of exciting innovations happening in the biofuels world. Um, it's exciting the new markets and things along those lines. Where do you see the biggest long-term opportunities as well as short-term um, for growth and technological advancement in the industry? Okay, so I'll start short. Short-term is continued use of ethanol in on-road transportation, cars and trucks in the US and abroad. We continue to see that demand. Uh, Canada is demanding more higher blends of ethanol. Brazil, uh, India, Japan, uh, Vietnam. So a lot of markets are actually increasing their goals and their standards specific to ethanol. So that's a, a great opportunity for us in the, in the, sh in the immediate and midterm. Long term, it's, it's exciting and it's a bit of a live ball. And there's a lot of innovation in R&D going into this. And there, there are really three areas, these are all in the hard to abate sector that we are looking at where, where ethanol could be a very viable feedstock. One is in aviation, where you've got sustainable aviation fuel that could replace jet fuel. There's a growing global demand and conversation about this. And so we're a viable feedstock because we, are, we have the volume, we can deliver the volume. Another area that we're looking at is maritime and replacing bunker fuel with ethanol. And so that's a whole new, uh, another area of exploration. And then ethanol replacing diesel in, in long haul trucking. And that's something that uh, a lot of companies are looking at. John Deere is even looking at this. So um, for their own tractors. So three, I would call them nascent markets. In each endeavor, we still have to be able to do, for some of them, proof of concept. We've got to get regulations in place. We've got to be able to produce at commercial scale and get the economics in line. But that's the blue sky potential. There's been the most conversation and visibility around sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and I've got a lot of members who are actively working on that. So we're excited about the long-term potential. Uh, we do need some policy support to be able to get there because we're talking about significant capital investment. And we are seeing that in things like this clean fuel production tax credit. Yeah, and on the, on the tax credit and driving innovations, what are some of the things that your members are doing to further decarbonize, to increase the value of there, whether it's CCS or on-farm, yeah. et cetera? So the, you know, the, the most readily available is carbon capture. Uh, and that, you know, that's exciting me because you've got so many industries are looking at carbon capture. Um, we have very clean, when you ferment uh, corn and you're making ethanol, it's a really clean carbon dioxide. So we can capture that, we can utilize it. About 25% of the plants are utilizing it today in food and beverage, or we can sequester that. If we sequester the carbon dioxide, that cuts our carbon intensity in half. Uh, so that's a huge step, that's a huge motivator for us as we want to be able to compete in a low carbon economy. We wanna be able to sell into Japan and compete against Brazil for those gallons to sell into Canada. So carbon capture is something that I've got a lot of members who are sequestering on site. There was a conversation on permitting reform. We are all <laughs> for permitting reform. Uh, and this administration, I think, is, 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 is with us in that regard. Um, there's a lot of conversation about what we can do on the farm. And there's a lot of excitement and interest um, within the farming community on you know, what we have historically called climate smart agriculture. There's a new acronym, and I can't remember what we're calling it these days. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's farming with fewer in inputs. We call it precision agriculture. There's a tremendous amount of innovation taking place there that's exciting that also reduces the carbon intensity of the fuel. And then replacing our power with renewable energy sources. So those are kind of three key areas where every single plant, the, cap the capital investment in our industry right now is in low carbon because we know that's where the global markets are going. That's where a lot of the state economies are going and it keeps us competitive. So maybe, uh one of the things that's, that's coming up here in the near term, we're in September, we're in harvest season, we have a big crop coming in. Maybe talk about how the administration is looking at biofuels from an agriculture perspective. We talked about trade and some of the issues going on there, seeing biofuels as a solution to some of these issues, not just affordability, but. Well, and it's, you know, Secretary Rollins is, uh, my head of regulatory affairs was with her in the UK on an ethanol trade mission, connecting buyers and sellers, because that's how committed they are. But if you look at the policy decisions specific to the renewable fuel space and the liquid fuels, the gasoline markets, the administration is making these announcements through the framework of US agriculture and maintaining strong biofuel demand. That is in the rhetoric when they're talking about it, it is in their press statements, and it's demonstrated in the policies that they're actually proposing, which are to blend more renewable fuel like ethanol. 
uh, to make sure that we have strong liquid fuels, including strong and growing demand for biofuel. So it's pretty evident that that's the lens through which they're looking at these policies and making the decisions. And it's a, it's a pretty strong through line, really going back to day one. Well, you guys have done tremendous work and over uh, a lot of difficult times over the, over the years and continue to advance the industry. So it's been a pleasure to work with you and watch this industry grow and be successful and innovative. So really appreciate your time Thank being you. here today. Anthony and I work together, and so it's, it's actually really fun that we're talking, but we actually have an audience. We have to behave a little bit, but thank you. Um, it's, it's a really exciting time, and I always go back with the industry. We've got strong bipartisan support, and that's really important because the conversation has, the terms of the conversation have changed in Washington, but they haven't necessarily changed in global markets. I spent a lot of time in Q4 in Southeast Asia and Japan because there's a huge demand for our product. So... We have to be conscious of that when we're talking about energy demand, and I appreciated the, the conversation on exports right before us, too. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.